welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to OnScript. I'm Matt Lynch, a co-host along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, and Amy Brown-Hughes. We're back with our regular show this week, having posted a few episodes of our brand new Biblical World podcast. You can subscribe to Biblical World wherever you listen and help others find the show by giving it a rating. Um, Or you could support what we're doing there by going to onscript.study forward slash donate and you can give. Uh, Thanks to everyone who has given already or who gives regularly to Onscript. Uh, It all goes to helping both shows get off the ground. Uh, thanks to Ed Hackey for producing this show, to Alan, Alan Files for help with the website, Rebecca Terhune uh, for all that she does with marketing and media. We've got Walter Brugman today, so hold on to your theological hats and enjoy the show. Welcome, OnScript listeners. Our guest today is no stranger to anyone familiar with biblical scholarship. Professor Walter Brueggemann is William Marcellus McFeeders Professor Emeritus of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. He's the author of over 100 books, a member of the Martin Luther King Jr. Collegium of Scholars at Morehouse College. He's the recipient of seven honorary doctorates. He's ordained in the United Church of Christ And he's just published Deliverance Out of Empire, Pivotal Moments in the Book of Exodus. It's the first in a uh, two-volume series that he's writing for the Pivotal Moments book series with Westminster John Knox Press. And it's a great resource for individual and group study. Uh, As opposed to a lot of the books uh, that we talk about on this podcast, this one is actually affordable. So there's no excuse to not go out and and pick it up. Professor Brueggemann, welcome to OnScript. Thank you, Matt. I'm glad to be able to talk with you. Yeah, you're someone that I've I've wanted to have on the podcast for a long time, so I'm glad uh, we were able to make this work. Uh, you write in the preface of your book that y- you say, I am near the end of my work. Uh, as you reflect back, what are some of the defining experiences that help shape the direction of your scholarship? Well, I think, um, uh, obviously, my graduate professor, James Meilenberg, shaped my uh perspective and methods a great deal led me to focus on the rhetoric of the text, which was his specialty. Uh, After that, I taught in seminary, uh, and so my work was largely trying to engage uh, church leaders and pastors, and I was uh, deeply uh, impacted by various waves of liberation uh, hermeneutic uh, of uh, 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 Central American scholars and uh, African American scholars and feminist scholars. So that's been a continuing uh, trajectory of my uh, learning process. And you did you also study with Hans Walter uh, Wolf as well? Well, I spent uh, a year's sabbatical in Heidelberg. Um, mm. My German uh, was and is very poor. So it wouldn't um, be right to say I studied with him, but we became friends. And as you may know, we published a little book together. So I was greatly influenced by him, uh, but I didn't really uh, study directly with him. Yeah. And then, uh, so that's on the biblical studies side. You talk about liberation uh, hermeneutics uh, in both biblical studies, I guess, and theology as well. Um, have been influential on you. What What are some of the other kind of theological influences? I I think uh, well, Karl Barth has been huge in my life, uh, and uh, I am much influenced by Paul Ricoeur. Uh, he's a philosopher, not a theologian, but I learned uh, so much from him. He was uh, very shaping for me. Uh, I had a, a colleague, Douglas Meeks, who uh, mediated to me the work of Jürgen Moltmann, hmm. uh, and uh, then um, the study of Abraham Heschel. I think uh, those would be the, the principal markers hmm. uh, for my uh, continuing development. Now, I've read a, a fair amount of your work, and 
you haven't let off the pedal um, when it when it comes to critiquing the big three that that seem to make some appearance in most of what you've written, and that is consumerism, militarism, and nationalism. Um, how did your thinking coalesce around those three threats to um, the the faith? Um, and some are what are some of the ways that the Old Testament offers a critique of those three? Well, uh, obviously, uh, uh, capitalism was not formed in the Old Testament, but they did have uh, militarism and they did have nationalism. Mm. And I believe that the uh, covenantal uh, tradition of Sinai that issued in the prophets uh, basically uh, was a, a critique of that uh, cluster of practices and was the proposal of an alternative so I believe that the uh, covenantal prophetic tradition uh, of the Old Testament uh, continues uh, to offer a critique and um, an alternative in our own time. And, of course, I think that the Jesus tradition uh, is a, a continuation of that uh, critical alternative trajectory. So that's uh, uh, I'm not a New Testament scholar, but that's how I understand the Jesus movement in the New Testament as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the features of your work uh, that I find refreshing and interesting is is the way that you don't shy away from connecting the dots into the New Testament, though. You know, you say you're not a New Testament scholar, but you you are regularly connecting the dots, and that certainly showed up in your Deliverance Out of Empire book. Um, is is that something you had to be deliberate in doing? Um, because it's it's not always a part of the field of Old Testament Hebrew Bible scholarship. Well, I am I myself am a practicing uh, churchman, uh, so it's on my mind, and uh, I uh, think that my primary uh, constituency for my scholarship are uh, church people, church leaders, and pastors. Uh, so I think that uh, pastors are always asking uh, of the Old Testament, uh, how how does that turn out uh, from a Christian perspective? So it's a kind of a, a natural move for me. Uh, I would not say that I have uh, very uh, consistent methods about making those connections, uh, but I continue to work at it. And uh, it's um, always it's always in my purview uh, as I do my writing. Let's talk about some of those pivotal moments in the book of Exodus that you talk about in your book, Deliverance Out of Empire. Um, how does the slave's outcry in Exodus 2.23 turn the tide of the story? Why was that the first defining moment that you focused on? Well, I think that uh, uh, critically, that cry uh, breaks the absolutism of Pharaoh's regime. I think until the cry is issued... Uh, Pharaoh um, uh, went unchallenged, and uh, uh, apparently the slaves uh, did not think until that moment that they had any alternative uh, to slavery. The other thing that that uh, uh, the text says that it was the uh, uh, cry of the slaves that evoked uh, the emancipatory God of the Exodus into action. So I was mm. taught in seminary uh, that God always takes the initiative about everything. Uh, but it seems to me uh, in the Exodus tradition, the initiative is taken by the slaves who, uh, by their uh, cries that are not really addressed to anyone, mm. but they rise up to Yahweh, the God of Israel anyway, because I think this God is a God who draws cries to God's own self. Hmm. Uh, so I think uh, that it's fair to say that that cry uh, really is the initiatory movement in the whole gospel narrative. Yeah, you said that that God is portrayed like a magnet drawing in those cries. Uh, so wherever they're issued, then that it's 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 like uh, I, I've compared it sometimes to a parent in a in a crowded room. Um, where w among all the noise, they suddenly their ears are attuned to their own kid crying out, and and their ears perk up when other people might think, "Hey, how did you hear that?" Uh, where whereas God is particularly interested in in that that cry. 
In fact, there's a, a text in uh, Isaiah 65 where uh, God says, "Before you call, I will answer." Mm. That's, that's a that's a parental response. <laughs> that's right. I knew what you were going to ask. Um, uh, it, and you go on to talk about the the account in Exodus three fourteen of Moses asking for God's name. What do you make of the enigmatic response, "I am who I am"? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a, I'm along with everybody else. I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> but I I think it is um, God's way of uh, of maintaining freedom for God's self on the assumption that if you know the name, you have some controlling power over the, the person. And um, I think that the enigma is uh, quite intentional, that God, while God commits to Moses and to Israel, God maintains God's freedom uh, and will not be uh, domesticated or captured uh, by Israel. I think it is a, a temptation of all moves toward orthodoxy of any kind to believe that we can capture God in some kind of formulation or something. And uh, so the freedom of God, uh, along with the freedom of Israel, uh, becomes a major accent point, I believe. And, and do you think there's also an aspect to that account where where God is saying that the name is not yet filled with meaning and that that the story itself is going to fill in the content of that name, whereas to give a name at this point is almost premature because it's going to become on the flip side, Yahweh who brought us up out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And that's, that's almost like the full name. At that I, point. I think that's exactly right, which means that you can't ever have this God without the story of emancipation. Right, right. Um, so you talk also in the book about the prevalence of the key word know, to know, yada in Hebrew, uh, in the Exodus story. And it was striking when you laid out all those texts how frequently this this word occurs. And it's it, it's at the heart of the plagues narrative that these plagues are a big show so that Egypt will come to know, Israel will come to know, the nations will come to know uh, who who Yahweh is. So how does the Exodus reshape or sharpen our understanding of what it means to know God? Well, I, th I think that that use of the word know probably also has the Sinai tradition in purview. So uh, on the one hand, it is... Uh, to recognize God's uh, emancipatory power and God's sovereignty. And on the other hand, it is uh, to know the will of God uh, so that uh, Israel has uh, early on important clues about what is required uh, if you're going to live faithfully in covenant with this God. Uh, so I think it is um, grounding both sides of, of this covenantal relationship in terms of God's gifts and God's commandments. And wh while uh, Pharaoh uh, d does not embrace the commandments, Pharaoh does have to come to terms uh, with uh, Yahweh's uh, sovereignty, uh, which leads to the debunking of Pharaoh's Egyptian gods. Hmm. Uh, why do you think, you know, Pharaoh doesn't die in this story? And... Um... It, it it's it's striking that the chief opponent uh, in in this this uh, foundational story doesn't end up dying. Why do you think that's significant, or is he in effect denuded of all power? What's uh, I, th the... I think so. I, I think for all practical purposes, mm -hmm. uh, he is de declared null and void. Uh, he has no power. He cannot keep any promises. So he's as good as dead. Yeah, that's what I think. You you write regarding the tenth plague uh, that the narrative about this death of the firstborn is terse. There is no apology for the brutality, no expressed wish that Yahweh had been less harsh toward the Egyptians. Uh, 
There's no explanation how such devastating power had penetrated the royal system. What do you make of the violence of this story? So, you know, it's one thing to to celebrate the emancipatory qualities of the Exodus story, but there's also the violence of the story. And so how how do you relate to that apology-less account? Well, I, I think it is... Um... It is told from the perspective of the emancipated people. And uh, when you, I suppose when you're desperate enough, you think any means toward emancipation is legitimate. Mm-hmm. And as you know, there is a, a rabbinic footnote to that, uh, that the, the next day God was seen weeping and uh, they asked God why he was weeping. And he said, my Egyptian children have drowned. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the rabbis also understood uh, that, that there is a certain awkwardness mm. to this unqualified violence, which which doesn't explain it and doesn't justify it, mm. uh, but it is uh, there is an awareness about it. Yeah, and that's an interesting parallel with a flood story, where where grief defines God's disposition toward the flood and the destruction of all that He made. So it, it, it's a logical connection. That's right. Exactly. Yes. And and what's the deal with hardening Pharaoh's heart in this story? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you know, I I think uh, uh, for dramatic purposes, what what the what the plague narrative does is to keep intensifying the conflict until something has to break. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I I think hardness of heart. Uh, is simply uh, Pharaoh's sense of his own absoluteness uh, and his inability to recognize what, in fact, is happening all around him mm-hmm. uh, as his power erodes. Hmm. There is, in, uh, as you well know, in uh, Mark 6, an amazing use of that phrase, hardness of heart, in which mm-hmm. it says that that the disciples could not understand about the ample bread that Jesus produced because of their hard hearts. Mm. And I take that to mean that they thought like Pharaoh. Mm. They, they thought in terms of scarcity, and mm. so they had no uh, categories through which to understand uh, God or Jesus' incredible capacity for abundance. Right. That's that's an interesting parallel. Yeah, the, the troubles of the hardening of the heart don't go away when you move to the New Testament, because it shows up in all four Gospels. So uh, th- this is not just an Old Testament problem. That's right. Or challenge. Now, Exodus is not just about liberation. Uh, it's also about formation. In fact, it gives more airtime to law and liturgy than to liberation. And, and to our minds those things belong in separate books, right? You you should have a a book about deliverance and liberation and freedom. And if you want a separate book, you know, there should be, that should be relegated somewhere else. But Exodus keeps those things together. And and how do you suggest that we're meant to hold those aspects of the book together? Uh, As you know, the uh, second volume of this little thing is coming out and it's about the other half. So in, in some ways, by dividing it in two volumes, we've acknowledged the, the, the uh, problem. Yeah. But uh, you quoted uh, uh, the first verse of the Ten Commandments, in which uh, the God who gives the commandments that dominate the mm. second part of it is the God of the Exodus. Right. And I think that is the uh, linchpin uh, mm. that the Israel's tradition refuses to separate uh, the emancipatory capacity of God uh, from the commanding authority of God. And there is a there is a place in Exodus 29, I don't remember the verse, hmm. uh, in which it explicitly says uh, that the God for whom the tabernacle is being built and hmm. designed and built is indeed the God of the Exodus. Hmm. So you can hmm. see the tradition working to try to connect those, right. uh, but it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, it's not obvious, and it takes some awareness and some assumptions to hook those together. Right. 
Uh, and, and as you point out in this book, and I guess as a preview for this second volume, the the Exodus story is also embedded in the law tradition in terms of grounding the kinds of practices Israel was supposed to engage in. You particularly get that, as you know, in the book of Deuteronomy, mm-hmm. uh, you shall do this because the Lord your God brought you out of the land of Egypt. And, yeah. and that is that is particularly so in um, uh, Deuteronomy 15 uh, mm-hmm. with the cancellation of debts. It's mm-hmm. a big, big accent on uh, the Exodus tradition about that. Right. And as you let slaves go, you're to let them go with furnished with all kinds of goods. So it's sort of reenacting the Exodus where they came out of Egypt with with their neighbor's possessions. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it, it's you had an interesting discussion of blessing uh, from below, uh, where Pharaoh asks Moses to bless him. Uh, why is that so significant? That was an interesting pivotal moment. I wouldn't have picked that one out, but what grabbed your attention about Pharaoh's requests? Well, as you know, the picking out of verses is somewhat subjective, but I, I think uh, we always assume that uh, people who have status and power are the ones who have the capacity to bless. Hmm. And it, it, I thought it was a, an astonishingly dramatic moment when uh, Pharaoh, in his fear and his anger, is finally expelling uh, Israel uh, from Egypt. Uh, he uh, He dismisses them. But then he says, oh, before you go, please bless me, uh, which would seem to me is, a, is an acknowledgement of this uh, uh, absolute power uh, hmm. that the power for life is lodged somewhere else. Hmm. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that's something we keep learning. And I suppose you could say that that in some ways, that's exactly the function of Jesus, in the gospel story, that Jesus blesses from below, and the and the uh, political and the religious authorities in his time uh, couldn't compute that, and really couldn't acknowledge uh, that this nobody w- was a carrier of powerful blessing. Hmm. Even though it was in the Psalms tradition, as you point out in the, in the book, that is that the psalmist and uh, the you know the choir director is constantly calling Israel to bless God. So so what does it even mean to to bless God? Because it, it's a it's a pretty fuzzy word. Yeah. Well, I think it means uh, it means to endow with the power of life, hmm. and it's astonishing. I mean, I suppose you could say it's a it's a kind of an empty liturgical formula by the time you get to the Book of Psalms. Uh, but if if you think about it, it is the assumption that the covenant relationship between God and Israel is so acutely dialogical that Israel has the capacity to bestow power for life on God. And I suppose in some inarticulate way, uh, our uh, gusty singing of doxologies in some way, we assume that this magnifies God. There are a lot of praise hymns with magnify in them. Mm-hmm. Make God bigger. Make mm-hmm. God stronger. Mm-hmm. Make God more noticed. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that, uh, which is a which is an awesome assumption uh, that we usually keep unexpressed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's interesting you say it, put things that way. Um, that seems to be another theme that runs through a lot of your work is is trying to grapple with the genuine covenant two-way relationship that exists between God and Israel and between us and God now uh, as well. What what are some of the persistent blockades to the genuineness of that relationship that that keep us from a truly dialogical covenant relationship with God? Well, I think, uh, I don't know whether we we inherited from uh, the Greek tradition or what, but we have in our uh, theological tradition uh, a conviction about God's absoluteness Mm. 
which is expressed as omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. And uh, when God is uh, occupied with all of these omnis, uh, it doesn't leave any space for the other. So, so I think, and I just read a rabbinic essay on that, the, the, uh, the dialogical uh, narrative of Israel's faith uh, is in deep tension and conflict with the whole Western tradition of, of the absoluteness, the absolute sovereignty of God. Hmm. And uh, uh, I think you're in a you're in a Calvinist context, and I'm in a Calvinist context. And and I think that Calvin struggled with this because in his in his more pastoral writings, hmm. he was more aware of this than when he lined out the syllogisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it's just something we have to continue to struggle with. Serene Jones, uh, the president of Union Seminary, has a a, a wonderful sentence uh, in which she says that uh, we understand God in God's incommensurability and God's mutuality. It's a, it's a wonderful pair of words mm-hmm. that you can't really put in the same sentence. Right. Yeah. To understand to understand God's incommensurability. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, that dialogical quality is at the heart of your work on lament as well. And in your article, the costly loss of lament is one of those classics uh, at this point that has had an enormous impact on a lot of people and anyone who who writes or talks about lament, especially in a scholarly context, has to engage with your your work. Is that is that dialogical quality what led you to think through lament? Well, it's hard to know how that you know how that works, how that all came <clears throat> upon me. I don't know what came first, uh, but I think it was my pastoral awareness. Uh, that uh, people in deep desperation begin to issue commands to God in their petitionary prayers. Uh, So it is uh, a mandate from below that is really characteristic of laments and complaints. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I think there is good reason uh, that the church tradition uh, across the whole theological spectrum, the church tradition has wanted to exclude laments uh, because they violate our kind of uh, easy absolutism about God and insist uh, that there's got to be dialogical force in this. Right. So I, I think, as, as you know, I've spent a great deal of my uh, scholarly energy on that particular question. Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, my awarenesses about that are as much as I can understand uh, from, uh, from Jewish tradition. Hmm. Uh, Jewish interpreters have always understood that dialogical hmm. aspect hmm. that keeps God relative to the relationship. Well, it, it, it reminds me of a, of a story that I've I've told on this podcast before when I, I was reading an interview with Kaim Potok and uh, about uh, that Kaim Potok had done. And he talked about growing up and there was a tradition in his synagogue where if someone had an issue with God at the beginning of the synagogue service, they would go up to the ark, open the, the curtains and shout at God. <laughs> and 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 until they finished the service didn't start and he grew up with this and 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 it always struck me as so discordant with my church experience where there's room for grief but it's in the private counseling session and not not in public worship I had never heard that story. That is yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He said sometimes, you know, someone would come up and quietly lead them away, I guess, if it went on and on and on. But <laughs> yeah. I just want to ask some general questions as well. Um, I, I always ask guests on the podcast, what's one idea in biblical studies that you think needs to die? <laughs> I don't know. 
Well, uh, I, I think the the uh, uh, the the whole critical tradition uh, that assumed an evolution of God from primitive to mm. Pauline <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> developmentalism. Mm. I, I think uh, we are in, in scholarly circles. We are moving away from that, mm. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that uh, really um, has been a, a, a very destructive idea that that basically shaped almost everybody's interpretation. Mm. And you still get that when people talk about the angry God of the Old Testament mm-hmm. and the nice God of the New Testament, mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah, the violent tribalistic God in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, I'll co-sign on that one. Um, what do you think is the most significant book in biblical studies in the last 50 years? Well, I, I would have two candidates. One, anything by Von Rod, hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> or or Heschel's The Prophets. I think that's a, a very durable one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I think that Von Rod's essay uh, on the problem of the hexateuch, hmm. which he published in uh, 1938, I think uh, was has been immensely shaping of uh, scholarship, even by people uh, who didn't want to go down that road. Hmm. Uh, so I, th- those would come to my mind. And, and how has that essay shaped the field? Well, it, w- it, was, it was an attempt to talk about uh, the traditions from Abraham, to, uh, from, the, from the book of Genesis uh, through the book of Joshua, uh, and uh, showed how these several traditions were related to each other, but how they were also independent of each other and may have had some independent developments. Mm. And when Van Rod traced the arc of the narrative from Abraham uh, to the end of the book of Joshua, uh, it uh, it turned out to be a promise fulfillment structure. Mm. Van Rod was a, was a Lutheran, so that worked out <laughs> very well for, for Van Rod. Uh, <laughs> and I just think... Um, it, it may be that that uh, Van Rod now is uh, passe among younger scholars, uh, but I think it's uh, been a very durable um, contribution. Um, I wanted to also say I, I've suggested this already that your your work has been really impactful on me, um, especially uh, three books in particular: the Prophetic Imagination, um, your Theology of the Old Testament, and your Psalms in a Life of Faith. Um, as well as your article, the the costly loss of lament. I'd I'd love to hear you reflect um, as you look back on your writing career. Which book or article, or maybe one or two of each, sits closest to your heart, and and why? Well, uh, of of my books, uh, the the most durable one has turned out to be Prophetic Imagination, uh, and uh, there's no doubt that I laid down the themes there that have informed uh, much of my subsequent work, particularly the accent on imagination Mm. that I was only beginning to understand Mm. uh, when I wrote the book and and have stayed at it. Uh, The other one uh, is, uh, uh, for me, is uh, finally comes the poet uh, in which I, it was an exploration of, of imaginative interpretation uh, and that was a kind of a breakthrough study for me mm. uh, that I've continued to develop. Mm. Uh, of my of my articles, in addition to the one you've mentioned on mm-hmm. uh, cost and lament, I did a, a piece in uh, Christian Century on abundance and scarcity, mm. uh, and that's kind of been a, a, a major trajectory for my thinking since then, mm. because. I believe that uh, the uh, the idols of nationalism, capitalism, the stuff that you name, mm-hmm. uh, are all uh, in the service of scarcity, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, the argument about who gets what, uh, and that is countered uh, by the gospel narrative of abundance. So that laid that out uh, in a, a fairly succinct little article. Yeah, and so the two books you mentioned both had the word imagination. Um, in them, uh, and and so, what is it about the imagination that is 
that the Old Testament in particular speaks to that you think the church needs to hear? Uh, well, I think uh, two things. One is that I think uh, texts do not have a single meaning. Uh, texts are always gifts that keep on giving, and uh, our, our education ought to equip us uh, both to practice interpretation and to be critical of our interpretation. The, the bigger work of imagination uh, is to say that the world in which we find ourselves is not a settled given, uh, that imagination uh, is the hosting of alternative worlds that may still come upon us. Uh, and I think uh, uh, imagination then becomes a tool against despair that imagines we are hopelessly lost in this present circumstance because imagination, evangelical imagination, is the conviction uh, that there are other worlds pushing in upon us if we have the courage to receive them. You write on page 63 of your book that the idea of holy nation, uh, quote, over time triggered a zeal for purity, a practice of ritual cleanness, and a claim of holiness that was not defined as a relation with Yahweh, but as a substantive, uh, substantive essence that came to be expressed in ethnic categories. And um, I was wondering about this. You, you, see, you seem to pit the social equality of the Exodus, you know, because it's a mixed multitude coming out together in the same terms uh, against the hierarchies expressed in purity laws. Could purity laws be seen in liberative terms as well? Is that is it? Are these two inherently in conflict with one another, or do you see a, just a profound tension between the purity system in Israel and the story of the Exodus? Well, I I think it's it's conceivable that that purity could serve uh, the well being of the community, but most often, it seems to me, it turns out. Uh, to be destructive. Um, and I think um, what we're seeing about racism uh, in the United States uh, is uh, one late expression of purity laws that people who do not fit this exact category are inferior and ought to be excluded and all of that. Uh, so I'm open uh, to the idea that purity can have a, a positive function, uh, but I think I wouldn't want to go there very often or very quickly. Yeah, well, it, it comes to mind because I did an interview with uh, Matt Thiessen on his book, Jesus and the Forces of Death, and, and he talks about, you know, the common designator for Jesus as the Holy One of God who comes and vanquishes uh, the sources of impurity um, that that either keep people from participation in the worship system or uh, debilitate them in some way. And, and it seems that, you know, throughout the gospel, Jesus addresses uncleanness um, and not the purity system as such, but, but, but the sources of death that would lead to um, their exclusion. Yeah. I suppose in a, a place like... Uh... Um, Mark 7, I think, is where he mm -hmm. has a long thing about that, that he is really advocating for a, mm -hmm. an alternative notion of purity and, mm -hmm. and all that. And mm -hmm. I guess that's something you could work on, yeah. Yeah, so it, one of the things that struck me about your, your book on Exodus 1 to 15 is that you started with the cry of the oppressed at the beginning, and you ended with the exuberant joyful praise uh, in the Song of the Sea and Miriam's song in, in Exodus 15. And I'd never thought about that arc of the story. And it just struck me, um, is the Exodus story basically one big lament psalm? Well, I think, I, think, I think it's very likely to be the case because, as you're suggesting, uh, the lament psalms characteristically end in well-being. Exactly so. Yep, yep. If the movement of the lament psalm is from grief uh, to dancing, the way you get there in the middle is the transformative action of God. 
That's exactly what you have in the Exodus narrative. So I think that makes perfectly good sense. Yeah, and do you think that story nourished the Lament Psalms then? Because I mean, because of the, I mean, do you think the the way it was recorded then? I don't know which came first. The, they seem like mutually resonating parts of Scripture. <laughs> I'm inclined to think that that the that the Exodus narrative is informed by the practice of lament, mm -hmm. but then it certainly fed back the other way mm -hmm. uh, to do that. There was a, a scholar uh, who published, as far as I know, only one book. His name is J James Plastaris, mm -hmm. and he made the argument about the arc of the Exodus narrative, about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure he related, I think he related to the Lament Psalms, mm -hmm. but it was, a, it was a very shrewd study. It's a, it's a quite old book now, mm -hmm. uh, and I learned from it, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, as someone who's spent a long time fighting, uh, you know, fighting the corner for Lament Psalms, what's, how do you relate to the all-out exuberant praise psalms, um, what's the place of those in the church, and how can they be misused? Well, I think uh, that good praise follows honest lament. Mm -hmm. And if there are praise hymns that are not preceded by a serious engagement about loss and hurt and all of that, I think they're phony, and I think they are an invitation to denial. And I, I think uh, uh, more evangelical churches use praise hymns, but more progressive churches do the same thing with their singing. Uh, it's a common temptation among us, hmm. uh, as I like to say, to skip Friday and rush to Easter. Yeah. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a friend of mine who, who says there's a difference between triumphal entry praise and Easter Sunday praise. <laughs> That's right. That's good. <laughs> yes. What other challenges do you think, you know, kind of in summary, the Exodus story brings to the church? What are, what are some of the dominant ways that the story unsettles us? Well, I, I, think, it, I think it has the, the critical function uh, of exposing the absolutism of Pharaoh. And so what we have to do in our uh, contemporary interpretation is to look for the performances of Pharaoh among us, because every time there is an absolutism of nation or race or gender or whatever, um, it is uh, destructive and contradicting the God of the gospel. So I think that's the the big thing. It it may be that that uh, when Jews talk about this narrative, uh, they focus on uh, chapters twelve and thirteen, which are the ground rules for Passover and so on. And it may be that that we need to pay more attention about how you develop liturgy mm -hmm. that lets us re-experience and re-perform. Uh, that amazing emancipation, hmm. which is hard to do uh, when we are reluctant to admit that we're in bondage. Yeah, yeah. Or when the emancipation of 1776 is is dominant in your imagination. That's correct. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, Professor Brueggemann, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak today about your book, Delivered Out of Empire: Pivotal Moments in the Book of Exodus. Uh, I encourage listeners to go out and get a copy and we look forward to volume two um, which is that going to be coming out in the next year or do out in october do out in october okay well uh, i appreciate you uh never mincing words and uh always stimulating uh, thoughtful engagement with the old testament in our contemporary context so thank you so much for your work and for this interview great to be with you matt thanks bye you have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study/donate.